Oh, thanks, everyone. I have uh, two announcements. First, we didn't use Easy Cater for this meeting, which is why the food never arrived. Also, and I just thought of this, effective immediately, everyone will be paid in wildly volatile cryptocurrency. You're all now billionaires. And now you're broke. Bad ideas happen when there's no food for the meeting. So make sure it's on time and as ordered for more than 80,000 restaurants. Now, Easy Cater. You're rich again. And now you're not. Order 24-7 on EasyCater.com. These are the final seconds. The lead in the fourth. Can they hold on to it? That do or die time. And everything rides on one shot. But it isn't going to be that easy. It's a one-point game. This is down to the wire. They're going to try the three-point attempt. One shot to take you to the top. One winner. This is clutch basketball. That's the NBA playoffs. That's game. Welcome back. Sports Radio 94 WIP. Joe Giglio with you. Tucker Bagley's behind the glass. You guys with us. 215-592-9494. That's a hot board. We got a lot to do next couple hours. Bob Wakel crossing broad will join us. Talks and Phillies after just, I mean, a disaster of a loss today to the Nationals. The Phillies are up 5 nothing. Blow that lead. Up 9-5 after McCutcheon home run. Blow that lead. Girardi's bullpen decisions have left a lot to be desired since last year, and they're getting worse. I mean, David Hale cannot pitch in that game today. Not in that spot. I, I have now put Girardi in the hot seat. If this doesn't turn around this season, like if they don't turn this thing around, Girardi can't be the manager here next year. He's just done an awful job with the Phillies. So we'll get back to all that. And uh, I wish instant replay in sports never happened. 33 minutes to finish the minute 30 of that game last night. Terrible. Let's talk to Elliot Shore Parks, and then we'll get back to all the phone calls. I don't even know if we're going to do any Eagles with Elliot. I just figured it's, it's Wednesday. Let's talk to Elliot. He's got thoughts on the Sixers, on Joel, on Ben, and maybe even the Phillies too. Elliot, how you doing, man? Doing good, doing good. Always down to talk Eagles, but uh, it's fun to talk different sports with you as well. Yeah, well, and, I, and this week there's a lot going on here. Obviously the disappointment with the Sixers. And, Elliot, I, I caught a little bit of your show with James. I, I, I'm – Trying, I've lost track of days, but I'm sure it was Saturday. I'm sure it was, I'm sure it was the Go yeah. Birds pod or the Go Birds show on Saturday. And I, and I believe I recall you guys having a little bit of a conversation on on the, the need for a change of scenery for Ben Simmons, for everyone's psyche, and, and kind of comparing it to the Carson Wentz situation. Now, just to be clear, I, Ben at this point is did not play as bad this year. Like, he was still an all-star. Carson obviously had a bad season. But what do you think about the parallels there to the end of the Carson thing and, and now what the Sixers are facing with, with uh, Ben? Yeah, it's interesting, right? I mean, I'm, I'm around the Eagles every day, so obviously I, I lived the Carson Wentz saga uh, much more close. But watching, you know, the Sixers from afar and watching the Ben Simmons situation, it's watching the exact same thing, right? It's a player that has not met the expectations that everybody hoped they would. I mean, you could argue Carson has even played at a higher level than Ben ever did, honestly, in 2017 and to a certain degree the end of 2019. I mean, Ben just never really reached the potential people thought he would as a number one overall pick. And, you know, listen to Daryl Morey, uh, I guess it was yesterday, and watching how things have gone with Ben, I can tell you right now how it's going to end because I saw how it ended with Carson. Ben's not going to be on the Sixers next year. They're going to trade him. I think they'll probably get better value for him than everybody thinks, much like they did for Carson. But, this is coming to an end, and I think it's better for both sides. I think Ben will be happier outside of Philadelphia. And the Sixers, make no mistake about it, they will be better for not having Ben on the team. Ben is a detriment to the team. I think much like Carson, uh, it'll be addition by subtraction. And I think the team will be better next year when they do move on from Ben. Ellie, when, when, when you know, major franchise players that people have hopes for and they buy their jerseys and they get all excited, like when, when tenures like that end, I, there's always for me like a moment in time where it's like I, I knew it was over then. And for Carson, you could pick out a few maybe last year, like the, the fumble against Dallas or the interception against the Browns, where it was like, this thing mm-hmm. is just, it's over. And for Ben, we know what it is. Forever it's going to be him not dunking the ball with 329 to go in that game. Elliot, you're watching the game Sunday night. What was your reaction when Ben Simmons, literally alone under the basket, didn't dunk the ball? Yeah, it, I think you make a great point that that exact moment was the turning point. Because, look, me and you have been – talking about Carson for years, right? I mean, since the day he was drafted, me and you've been talking about him. And I would say for a while, we were on an island, you know, saying we didn't think he was that good and we thought he was holding the team back. And then last year, I would say a lot of people kind of said, you know what? Yeah, he's holding this team back. I have a lot of friends that I talk, you know, basketball with and Sixers. And when Ben didn't dunk that ball, all my friends that have been defending him were instantly like, okay, you know what? He's got to go. So it's silly to think that one play can kind of, hold that power, but it was really 
the, you know, the sum of a lot of things, right? The missed free throws, only, you know, not shooting in the fourth quarter. I mean, let's be honest, if Ben Simmons plays even 30% or 40% of the player he was during the regular season, the Sixers are playing tonight. Like, we're talking about them playing in game one of the Eastern Conference Finals. So uh, it's completely his fault, really, that they're out. I mean, look, Joel certainly holds some blame, but it is amazing that that one play, you know, really turned everybody's mind. I don't think you'll find anybody that defends that right now after that. Yeah, no, you won't, because it's just been a week of everyone trying to figure out how they get rid of him, what they get rid of him for. And, and you said earlier you think they get something maybe better than – and the perception is right now because the perception is, you know, no one wants this guy and everyone realizes he can't shoot and all that. You wrote the other day, you put together some thoughts and ideas on, on trade names and packages. I mean, the one that keeps popping out to me is, is Dame Lillard. I don't know if they could get him. Um, when you were kind of going through the trade machine and thinking about what they could trade for him, what, what kind of names were out there? Because that's, that's going to be the story of the offseason, like who they get and who they now try to pair with Joel. Yeah, so Damian Lillard would be – to me, the, the best possible outcome. He's a guy that can be the best player on the team. He's a guy that in crunch time can take the big shot. He can shoot from beyond the arc. Obviously, we've seen him do that at a very high level for a lot of years. He's a perfect complement for Joel Embiid. Now, to your point, can they get him for Ben Simmons? Probably not, right? Unless Damian Lillard decides he wants to come here and the Blazers you know, trade him to Philadelphia, you're talking about adding you know, two, three first-round picks, maybe Tyrese Maxey, maybe even Thigh Bull. So, I do think that getting him will be hard. I think from a lesser degree, you know, maybe C.J. McCollum, he's a guy that can do some of the things the same does, just not at the same level. Zach, Zach Levine out of Chicago is a guy that I think is extremely underrated. Uh, he, you know, shoots almost 40% on eight or nine threes a game. He averaged about 23, 24 points, if not more, actually, last year. So he's a guy I would look after or, look, you know, look, look for. But the, the team I think is actually going to be the most likely to get Ben is the Cleveland Cavaliers. There was a report from ESPN that they're interested in trading that number three pick to get an, all, uh, you know, an all-star type talent right now. Well, Ben's that guy. Look, we all know Ben in the postseason is not that good. But in the regular season, he is a team that helps. He is a player that helps the team win. And I think the Cavaliers are just so desperate to get to the postseason. Maybe they trade that number three overall pick for a guy like Ben. Yeah, and then who knows? Maybe Daryl Morey could you know, package the third pick and, and get another player somewhere else, the, the kind of player we're talking about. Elliot Shore Parks joining us here, Go Birds Pod, and of course all his writing on 94WIP.com. Elliot, the other part of this, and, and I, I wrote something on this the other day, is, is the fact that the, the Sixers don't just need a guard that can shoot. I think that, of course, everyone knows that. I also think they need someone that could be the guy who scores in the fourth quarter because it's almost like, you know, we're not talking about this now because the Ben thing is the, is the conversation. But, man, Joel Embiid turned the ball over 16 times the last two games, and it just feels like every playoff it's the same thing where he's either tired or hurt, and at the end of playoff series, he just can't take them home. Um, I don't think he's a closer, and I think not only do they need to trade for a guard, like the guys you mentioned, they need someone that could take the last shot of playoff games. That's what they're missing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so growing up in Philadelphia, my favorite basketball player was Allen Iverson. You'll never catch me saying anything negative about Iverson. And since then, I will say Joel Embiid is probably my favorite sixer to watch play. He is a special talent, and you can really see the way he connects with the city, probably you know, the closest since, honestly, Iverson has in terms of just being a fan favorite. But I think we all need to, for a second, look objectively at this and say, if any other team in the league was building around a center that was injury prone and that consistently came up, you know, short in the playoffs for whatever reason, short in the playoffs, we would say that's not a good idea. Like Joel is definitely a special talent, but there's certain things he just can't overcome. He is a center in a guard dominated league. He is a guy that is seven foot, you know, 280 and that at the end of games is tired that Joel is a great talent, but he could not be the best player on a championship team. It's just too hard in today's NBA. So, look, I would not trade Joel Embiid by any stretch, don't get me wrong, but they have got to figure out a way to get someone on the team that is better than Joel Embiid that plays guard. And that's why I would not make decisions about building around Joel. When it comes to Ben, yeah, maybe C.J. McCollum makes his team better right now, but I'm more interested in trying to find a way to get a player that can become an elite guard for years to come. Like, I'm talking to the Orlando Magic about getting picks five and eight to see if that can turn into a guard. Talking to the Cavaliers about number three, because this team, you know, everyone calls them a championship contender. They haven't been out of the second round. Like, they're not really a championship contender with Joel as their best player. 
And they're not going to be until they get a guard as their best player. Yeah, and I saw you tweet yesterday. Daryl Morey said a lot of interesting things during his press conference, including uh, you know a, a minute back and forth with Howard Eskin, where you know H- Howard's trying to ask him, "Is Ben going to be here?" And he's, you know, I mm-hmm. thought I thought Morey tried to make light of it so he didn't have to really answer the question. But one thing he did say was, "Man, the game is tilted towards guards." And I heard that, and I saw you tweet it, and. You know, he wasn't talking about Joel Embiid, but it's it's hard not to read between the lines. Like the Sixers' best players, not just Joel, but the other one is Tobias. He's a four. Like their best players and scorers are not guards. Like that's that's a big deal. I think everybody would agree that Daryl Morey is one of the best general managers in the NBA. Nobody would dispute that. Did he ever build his team around a center in Houston? Nope. And again, Joel, Joel is a special talent. Maybe he's somebody you break the blueprint for. But the bottom line is Daryl Morey is correct. This league is easier to win with guards. We all saw it against the Hawks. Joel Embiid was getting fouled consistently down in the post, and it's not called. Trey Young's out on the perimeter, and you can hardly breathe on him before he's on the line. So, what you know, Daryl Daryl Morey said he hopes the rules change, but they're not going to. The, the league is not built for interior players. So, yeah, Joel is special, but you can't tell me deep down that Daryl Morey wouldn't prefer his best player to be a guard. I mean, even just the fact that Joel has to work so hard for two points, whereas a guy like Damian Lillard, who's maybe not the player Joel is, can just shoot threes, right? And he gets an extra point for that. So I just don't believe that Daryl Morey wants his best player to be a center. I don't think that means they're going to trade Joel, but I think it means that they are going to try really, really hard to get a number one option that's a perimeter player. All right, Elliot, last thing for you. I don't think you and I have ever discussed this, so I have no idea what your take on, take on it is. But last night I'm watching right. the end of the uh, the Suns game with the, the cool alley-oop to win the game, and there's so many replay reviews and stoppages. The last minute 30 of that game, like on, you know, on the clock in the fourth quarter, took 33 minutes of real time. And, and so I'm at the point now with replay, I feel like it sucked the, the drama out of sports. So I would say if, if we had a time machine tonight, I would go back and I would make instant replay, you know, for challenging and changing calls never happen in sports. Would you do that? Do you like replay or, or are you with me? And it's, it's kind of sucked the life out of these big moments. What, what do you think of replay? Yeah, here's a, another angle to that. So I don't know if you're a soccer guy or not. I mean, I know you're, you excel at all sports. so I'm sure you enjoy soccer as well, but the Euros are going on right now. And a big thing with soccer is the VAR system, right? And, you know, whether the fact that they challenge replays, and penalty kicks and all that stuff. And I think when you combine that with the fact that, yeah, last night that the game took that long is ridiculous. I am also getting to the point where I'm OK with human error, or at least it should only be to a point where it's so extremely obvious that everyone knows it. Like you, you look at the, um, the Saints and Rams game a few years ago, right? Like everybody knew that that was a flag and they couldn't do anything about it. Like I'm OK with replay in certain instances, but when you get to the point where a goal is being called back because a guy is, you know, a half an inch offside but when you look at the replay or when, you know, in the NBA they're challenging certain fouls three four times a game, then I do think you have reached too much. I'm somebody that believes more information the better, but I think in this instance it's gone a little too far. Yeah, and the, the point I always bring up, like in baseball, what – the, uh, when they steal a base and they and they watch the replay and like the guy comes off the base by a centimeter and right. the, and the player's glove is on him he, he beat the throw he was safe and they call him out that's like it's like we've we've broken the spirit of the idea it's it's gone too far now yeah I, I agree and I think it honestly look I'm sure the refs to a certain degree appreciate it because it gives them a safety net but you know in real time that that's what happened like you know in real time he was safe in real time this goal was scored like I think it should really only be used. For, for egregious situations. All right, so the last, quickly, last thing. I, I saw you tweet the other day that um, you can't wait for Eagles training. What's the countdown now? 34 days? We're not that far away. Yeah, something like that. July 28th, I think, is when they report. I don't know the first day we'll be down there, uh, you know, uh, chart, charting all the throws and, and covering practice. And look, as much as I love talking basketball with you, I can't wait to do daily check-ins from training camp. It's my favorite time of the year. I've been covering the team for a long time, and, you know, obviously 2017 was a special season, but in terms of just entering a season of a level of excitement to see what's going to happen, I think this is the biggest one of my career in terms of just going into the season. I'm excited to see Sirianni. I'm excited to see Jalen Hurts. I'm excited to see Devontae Smith. Like, no one saw 2017 coming. That ended up being a special year. But this season, I think, has the most intrigue we've seen in the Eagles season in a long time. It's going to be fun. We'll be following, and we'll be talking a lot during it. Thank you, Elliot. We'll talk soon. Sounds good. Talk to you later. There he goes. Elliot Shore Parks with some basketball takes, baseball takes, instant replay, soccer. You you uh you watch the Euros, Tucker? What are you, what are you, you watching the Euros when you wake up during the day? No, I mean, the only one I watched was when that, that 
uh, guy that was from Denmark went into to cardiac arrest. Yes, that was scary. That was scary, and luckily he's okay. The one thing I, I did find interesting, which soccer is very proud of, it's running clock. Mm. They didn't stop the clock for that, Joe. Just kept going. Yeah, I mean, a, a man suffers cardiac arrest on the field, but you can't be bothered to stop the clock in soccer. Yeah, I would say there should be a, a cardiac arrest option. Like or, if a heartbeat stops, so should the clock. Yeah, I think that's a very simple addendum they could make to, I, I don't know what they call it, um, I'm going to pretend it's the Constitution of Soccer, whatever it is, the collectively bargained Euro Agreement, whatever they want to call it. I agree with Tucker on that. 215-592-9494. Let's go back to the phone lines here. Steve is in Wildwood. Steve is Joe. on w- – hey, Steve. Joe, how you doing, pal? I'm doing well. What's on your mind? All right, well, hey, you know, we usually agree on most things, and I'm not saying I totally disagree with you on Joe Girardi, but here's my, here's my reason why I'm not so on his case – because essentially, Joe, he's taking a knife to a gunfight every day here with his pitching staff. When, let's look at this critically. Wheeler, he's been great, but hey, what he did the other night by only going three innings really hurt him across the board for the from there on out last night and today. Nola, he's been average. Eflin, he's two and six with a plus four ERA. We keep talking like this guy is good. He's really below average. Steve, before you go on, it, it, it's, uh, I find it very ironic, right? So you look at Zach Eflin's career, and I, I, I think I brought this up the other night. When, you know, everyone said you know, the pitching coach here when Kapler was here, Chris Young, he kind of ruined him, right? And, and yeah. the other guys let him do what he wants. It, every pitching coach he's had from Kranitz to Chris Young to now yeah. Caleb Cotham, it's the same thing. His ERA is always just about four. It doesn't matter who his coach is. That, that just might be what he is, a four yeah, ERA he's guy. he's a five. Yeah. He's a five, Joe. He's a five. And, and Noel's a three, and you're missing two left-handed starters. You need a stud lefty behind Wheeler and another lefty in between Nola and Eflin as those are three and fives. But my point is, this is, you know, unfortunately, Joe's taking this knife to a gunfight, and he's losing. And I, and I get you – know, so it's hard to make the right moves when the talent is just so bad. And then look at the bullpen. Naris, Alvarado, Coonrod, Bradley, and Brogdon. That's helter-skelter. It's like Mr. Toad's wild ride. One day they're good. One day they're so bad. And Naris, <laughs> I don't care what anybody says. You'll, they'll never win a singular significant game with that guy trying to close games because he is just, he doesn't have it. Well, the, the problem right now is, I know a lot of people are, and even Girardi said he'll think about the situation after the game, but like he's, Unfortunately, he's still their best option. I know that that's pathetic, that sums up that sums it up that like yeah. he, he's still the best option he has. Yeah, well, and, and here's where it goes to Joe, and he's and Naris to me is the poster child of the real root of the wrong of this organization, and it goes back to the decisions to number one decide to go with a Moro over um, Mike Arbuckle, which was a devastating mistake because Mike Arbuckle, by the way, took the low budget. Royals to the 2015 World Championships, and then they made the cataclysmic decision to not take Heim Bloom, over, and, and they took Quintac. And now, so we're now we're sitting here since 2008, 12 years of terrible drafting and development, and we it, Joe Girardi can't overcome that. It, Casey Stengel couldn't overcome that. Leo DeRocha couldn't overcome that, Joe. Nobody can. Well, I agree there's a lot of deficiency here. But I mean, today, Steve, I mean, David Hale cannot come in that oh. spot. So, like, it's not just, he shouldn't be on the team, I Joe. know, and that's why I get frustrated with Girardi. Like, that's a big spot in the game. You're, you're about to blow the lead again, and you bring him right. in. It's just like sometimes he, the moves he makes, the guys, he, when he chooses to bring in, who he brings in, yeah, it, I, it doesn't make sense. No, I do agree with you there. What was his other option? I mean, is was he maybe showing to Dombrowski, look, this is the garbage you're giving me. You know, what do you want me to do here? Well, if that's the case, I, I mean, I, I get that that happens sometimes, but they lost the game today. I mean, that, it's, I know. And, they, and this uh, is a big week for them, to the Nationals, oh. for the Mets. Like, this was the week they could climb back in it, and they're just thinking it up. Yep, they are, man. It's, it's, it's a devastating shame. And I'd like to comment on your um, replay thing. Yeah, what do you think? Well, here's I, I'm with you on that one. Get rid of it, because here's why. I have this image of the great Dallas Green with that. You know, I had the white, gray hair. It was up, and it, his hat's off, and he comes out of the dugout. He missed the tag. He missed the tag. <laughs> yep. Are you kidding me? It takes the raw emotion of everything about every game out of it. Yes, and, and, I, and I miss it. And, and, Steve, I always appreciate it. I miss that. 
Like, even manage your arguments. Last night was kind of Mickey Mouse because, you know, what is Jordy doing trying to, to go after Scherzer and, and all that? And, and we'll play for you in a couple minutes. Mike Rizzo's response this morning was wild down in D.C. on uh, on 106.7 The Fan. Mike Rizzo, the GM of the Nationals, came back at Girardi. But, like, that kind of stuff is is rare. Manager arguments are rare because the replay, everyone's like, I'll just check the replay. That, that'll that figure the whole thing out. A lot of the emotion of the game has been taken away. Kashmir's in Pasta. Hey, Kashmir. Hey, Joe. So I, I wanted to call, and I had to get in today. So if you just give me about one minute to really go off on the Phillies right now. Go now, ahead. Go ahead. I, I'm about to vent, and I, I can't stand it anymore. And I'm just so sick of what I'm seeing. I listen, I was heartbroken with the Sixers, but – as you know, I'm a bigger I'm a bigger baseball fan than I am even a football and, and basketball. I love pretty much all Philadelphia sports except for the Eagles, as you know I'm a Falcons fan. But the Phillies are my first love. I love the Phillies more than any team else in the world. I love the Phillies more than anyone else. I watch every Phillies game. And and, and I, it makes me so sick, Joe, because and we and what's even worse, Joe, is that it's, it's a frustration. Here's it, what we thought about the Sixers was the frust with the fr- what's made it more frustrating and more maddening and saddening and just disgusting was that the Sixers, even though we know they didn't have a championship team, they could have won the NBA title this year, the way everything broke. The Phillies, Joe, the way the – we talked – when we did the – when you guys did the Phillies roundtable, I think it was before the season, you said, hey, listen, look at the division. It's going to be an extremely tough division. It's probably one of the best divisions in all baseball, if not the best division in baseball. And we said, listen, if it was the NFC East, if it was the NFC East of football, the Phillies could win that division. Well, guess what? It is the NFC East. You're right. You're right. It it, it turned into that, and they still are in fourth place. Fourth place. And they still are in fourth place. It is disgusting. And, you know, I am so sick of watching this because, you know what? No, we we can't trade off. I am am to the point now. Our play, like, listen, guys like Eflin, and Nola has a 4.06 ERA. Are you kidding me? What what are we doing here? The guy went from being a possible Cy Young Award candidate in 2018 to now he can't even be a top four, four top four or five starter. Cole Irvin has a better ERA than he does. Nick Clement has a BR, better ERA than he does. In the American <laughs> League, by the way, in the American in League, the American, like with better competition. Oh, we what are we doing here? This is a joke, and, and I don't care if we take off Bryce Harper. I don't care if we take off JT Real Muto, because if I'm Dave Dombrowski and if I'm John Milton, I'm going to say, you know what, then you guys start playing better. You guys start hitting more home runs. You guys start hitting with, with runners in scoring position because you're not doing it. You know what, we need to trade off Aaron Nola, trade off Reese Hoskins, trade off Zach Eflin, trade off Hector Neris, trade off uh, – Try and trade off Sam Coonrod. Try. I, we need to. I. I want to be a big. I don't care. We need to sell and sell big because I am sick to death of seeing team after team after team can just bring up player after player after player after injury after injury. Just bring up player after player and just continue to have success while the Phillies are completely in a rudderless gut hole. Well, well, I mean, while we're watching David Hale pitch in high leverage spots. Yeah, we're watching David Hale pitch in high leverages, and he gives up a grand slam to Josh Harris. What are we doing? This is just disgusting. I am so sickened right now to be a Phillies fan. I, I can't even – it blows my mind because this team should be – we knew that they were going to be a little, a little bit above average. But they're they're not even average. No, they're not. They're they're below. They're, they're, they're below. I mean, they're thirty and thirty seven since the the four and zero star. Cashmere, listen, I appreciate it. You catch your breath. We'll talk. So you know what that was right there? That was a decade of losing that just broke a man. A decade of losing just broke Cashmere on WIP. I mean that that was that was that was raw emotion. That that's what ten years of garbage gets you. Ten years without a winning season. Cashmere is breaking, and I have a feeling that other people are breaking, too. 215-592-9494. Joe Girardi should be in the hot seat. Agree, disagree, and instant replay in sports. I wish it never happened. Are you with me on this, or do you like instant replay and think it provides more good than bad? I just – I can't – I'm 33 minutes for the final minute 30 of an NBA playoff game. That is a – that's ridiculous, and that's what last night was with the Suns-Clippers game. And we get back in this side. We'll play Mike Rizzo for you, what he said about Joe Girardi, and – I will give you my Ben Simmons trade, the trade I would do as soon as it's on the table 
See if you guys agree or disagree. 215-592-9494 in Sports Radio 94 WIP. Oh, thanks, everyone. I have uh, two announcements. First, we didn't use Easy Cater for this meeting, which is why the food never arrived. Also, and I just thought of this, effective immediately, everyone will be paid in wildly volatile cryptocurrency. You're all now billionaires. And now you're broke. Bad ideas happen when there's no food for the meeting. So make sure it's on time and is ordered for more than 80,000 restaurants. Now, Easy Cater. You're rich again. And now you're not. Order 24-7 on easycater.com.